All right, hello everybody. I'm uh, Wilkes Joyner. I work at Cicada. We're a uh, uh, software company building software for the legal services industry. Uh, we're a closure development shop. We do um, everything in closure from the front end web UIs using closure script to the server side using closure to the database using Datomic to the transport layer sending, streaming, closure across the wire. So we're we bought into it all, whole kit and caboodle, and uh, we're having a great time with it. Um, today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, functional reactive programming, um, which is uh, a fairly novel approach to dealing with um, asynchronous events and communication, uh, but using some very familiar constructs. Um, uh, so Heraclitus in 500 BC uh, said many, many things. One of them was everything flows, nothing stands still. He was the same guy who also said uh, you never step in the same river twice, for example. Um, a lot of the systems that we build actually live in this world, right? Things are constantly changing. What we do is we, all of us in this room, I believe, we build systems. These systems help human beings. Human beings interact with these systems. We respond to those interactions, maybe triggering events for other systems to process. This is fundamentally what we do. Right? This, is, this, this, this is something we always encounter. Um, so, so we deal with streams of events. We're really good at doing fire and forget sort of, sort of events. That, that, that part's not, not too bad, right? Something happens, trigger an event, put it on a queue, Forget about it. We don't have to worry about it anymore. We've done our part of the job. All right. We do this in UIs all the time. Uh, we make AJAX calls from the web UI. Hey, they clicked on this. Kick off this process. Um, we do it on the back end with messaging queues. Um, this is all pretty standard stuff these days. Um, processing events is a little trickier. Uh, we we don't really have a good set of abstractions for dealing with the processing of events. Um, one thing is, it's, it's one thing to say, on this event, do this one thing, right? But that's pretty simplistic. We really want to be able to say, on this event, handle these other events and compose them together in some interesting way, right? We end up having, especially when we're talking about the UI, We've got all kinds of things that could be happening. We've got events that could come in from all different points. Uh, and handling that is, is incredibly error prone. It's a, lot of, um, it's a lot of plumbing that we've got to put into place. All right. um, typically, it, that, that plumbing is handled through callbacks, and we end up with callback hell. Right? Uh, it's not too uncommon. How many people are familiar with Node, Node.js? Right, I mean, you can end up with like five or six callbacks, and you're, you know, all nested together. Impossible to figure out what you're actually trying to do. <laughs> right, <laughs> it buried in there is probably like five lines of code that is actually meaningful. The rest of it's all wiring it all together. Right, this is, this is, this is not a good situation for us to be in. So we're going to need a bigger boat. We need to figure out how to, how to deal this, deal with this. So this is where FRP comes in. Um, so FRP is a model for values that vary over time. Now, this is, this is a very tricky phrase. Uh, this is different than a variable, right? Variables change over time, they mutate over time. This is kind of uh, an alternative view of a variable, right? We'll have... Um, we, we have this, this, this value that represents and kind of wraps some other value that, that, that's going to change over time, right? But that, that value that we, care, that we reference is, is literally a value. It's constant. It's unchanging. The value that's wrapping, that'll be changing over time. We need to find a, a sane way of dealing with that, right? Uh, this, like a lot of the big ideas that are coming out over the past few years, originated in the Haskell community. Um, there's uh, several different implementation styles. Uh, we're going to focus on one that came out of Microsoft, uh, 
their reactive extension framework for .NET, um, which is available for .NET. Uh, there's a JavaScript implementation. Uh, Netflix released a Java implementation because they've been using it on their to handle their um, service communication layer uh, for about a year now. Uh, so they open sourced that, so that's available. Um, in particular, there's uh, a, a JavaScript implementation called BaconJS, which was heavily inspired by Microsoft Reactive Extensions. Uh, it's a little simpler and has a, less, a few less gotchas. Uh, JavaScript's essentially single-threaded, so uh, they, could, they could avoid some of the scheduling issues that you have in a, in a multi-threaded environment. The fundamental concept that we're going to be looking at is, uh, is this notion of an observable. Uh, how many people are familiar with the observer pattern? All right. So an, an, observer, an observer is going to say, hey, let me know when something happens. Right? It's, it's going to kind of subscribe to an event. Observable marries the notion of something that's iterable, like a list, uh, for example, uh, with the observer pattern. It provides you with all the typical sequence functions. You can, you can map over the observable. You can filter the observable. You can reduce to create a new observable. You can just take five items off the observable. Right? So it's, you can kind of think of it as an, as an asynchronous list of events. Right? Uh, at some point, you want to do something with these events. That's where subscribe comes into play. Um, there's also a way you can add error handling. If anybody's familiar with the Promise API, it's kind of kind of a similar notion there. You have a done, you have an error, you have that sort of that sort of thing. Um, they also add timing functions. Uh, for example, we may want to throttle events. Uh, we only care about events every 500 milliseconds. For example, we don't want every single event. Uh, and then there's this notion of buffering events. Uh, sometimes we want to know what this event was, we want to compare it to the last event. Right? That's a, that's, that can be a fairly common uh, use case. Uh, and finally, we, they need to be composable. We need to be able to take these, these observables and uh, combine them together to build new observables so we can work at a higher level of abstraction. Um, one of the ways that they use to, uh, to to explain observables and kind of explain the API is this use of marble diagrams. I'm only going to show one because we have a short amount of time. Um, but this will help if you go, uh, if you're interested in this and want to find out more, you'll see these diagrams and it's good to have an idea of what they, what they represent. Um, so here we have an observable A. And then this, uh, this arrow is over time. Uh, now we have another observable B over time. And what we want to do is we want to merge A and B over time, right? So, whoops, my slide, I changed my style so it would appear better. That should say one in there. <laughs> so we have our first item come in. It's going to, it's on observable A. It's going to come down here and generate a new item for observable B. I mean, for the merging of A and B. After that, an item comes in on B, and it again is going to be put onto this, this new stream. Right? And finally, we've got a third event, A and B. So you can see here that basically what we've done is we've taken two separate event streams and merged them together so that we can treat them as one event stream. Uh, think of a case where your user can close a window two different ways, right? They can click on the Xbox, right? That's the A stream, or they can escape. That's the B stream, right? We don't really care which one happens, right? But we want to respond to them both the same way, right? That's a that's a big, big, big step away from how we're currently doing things, and particularly in the JavaScript world. Um, so I'm going to give kind of a real-world example here and try to walk through it as quickly as I can. Um, so there's uh, autocomplete, right? This is something that users always want. Um, so a, a naive implementation, right, is going to be, but a common implementation that you've definitely seen in a lot of code is 
Um, handle the key up event. Uh, when that happens, get the value. We probably want to check whether the value is a certain length, in this case three or more. Then we want to make some sort of remote call. All right, so now we've got two, two event streams at that point. Right? And then we get a response back. We want to check to see if it's a valid response. And then we want to display the results. All right, that's pretty simple implementation. Um, however, that's really not enough in practice. Really, you need to do all of these things. Right, because we're dealing with a remote resource, we don't want to hammer it. Right, so again, we want to keep, the, we want to get the key up event, we want to get the value of the field, but we only want to do this every 500 milliseconds. We don't want to keep hammering the server every time there's a key up event. Right, uh, we still want to check whether the link is length is three or more, but we want to skip duplicates. Right, if they, if we just send a request off for, you know, query ABC. Uh, and then they type DE and then backspace, backspace, and still ABC. We don't want to send the, the query again, right? We've already got our answer. We don't need to do that, right? <clears throat> then we want to make our remote call, and then we want to filter all our bad responses and display the results. Now, just kind of mentally go through your head what this would look like, right? I mean, this is, you, you have this version implemented, right? And then, your ops guys are like, whoa, we're hammering the server. We've got you know, 500 users who are just banging the heck out of this query. What's going on? You guys got to fix this, right? And so you're like, oh, now I got to go back. I got to throttle that. And then how do I even do that? I don't know. Maybe somebody somewhere has figured out I can copy the code. You know, it's <laughs> not, not fun stuff, right? So, so here, I've got a uh, little thing that'll search Wikipedia. So we can type ABC, right? And, we've, and we get back a list of 10 responses from Wikipedia. So this is just calling out to Wikipedia, giving our you know, DE, right? Well, let's go back. All right, now we're not hitting the query anymore, right? So we've got all of our pieces in here. So what does this code actually look like? Um, I warned you we're a closure shop, so you're going to have to bear with the parentheses. But let me make that a little. Can everybody read that? Is that good? Yeah. All right. So, so here I'm using bacon. I've wrapped it in a closure script library that I call yolk because I like to dip my bacon in my yolk. Uh, the the first thing we're doing is we're handling the key up event on the search input. So here we're just using jQuery. We're grabbing the event. So now this is going to give us a stream for every time somebody hits it, there's a key up, we're going to get a new character or a new, yeah, we'll get a new key up event. Uh, we don't really care about the event. We just want to know what's in the input box. So we're going to map over that stream and just get the value out of the input box, right? So now we'll get ABC or A, and then AB, and then ABC, right? Um, we want to throttle this to uh, 500 milliseconds. Let me remove this one thing out of here. Um, we want to throttle this at 500 milliseconds. There's a nice little built-in thing that all these libraries have. There's delays and throttles and that sort of thing. So now, we, we only care about the value every 500 milliseconds, so We'll get any, we'll keep, these will keep generating streams, but this one will only gener stream, generate a new value every 500 milliseconds, all right? Uh, and then we want to filter out where the count is, uh, is uh, less than three. And then we want to skip our duplicates, all right? So that's, that's bullet point by bullet point <laughs> what, what we actually want to do. Right? That's, that's a much higher level of abstraction. Right? The, the interesting thing here is that this code is not written for, um, for writing web UIs. You can do this on your server. This is a general construct that we can use now in our programs at any place in our programs where we're dealing with asynchronous communication. Um, that's, a, that's a very, very powerful concept. So if you're familiar with uh, Knockout or Angular or Ember, right? They all have these, uh, Cocoa, they've got these wonderful data binding 
uh, frameworks, right? But they're very specific to the UI layer, right? This is this is an influent This is how it gives you a way to do that without um, without tying yourself to one particular layer of your app, right? Uh, the next thing we have is our search Wikipedia, which is just going to make a regular AJAX call, but this is a special AJAX call that's going to return back an observable, right? Because we, we're going to need, we want to compose these together now, right? And so that's what we'll do here. We'll, we'll, we'll get our throttled input, right, which we defined up there. And then we're going to flat map the, the, the latest. So what this is going to do is when there's input on this stream, we're going to search Wikipedia, right? Which is going to give us this observable. And then we're going to convert it to closure script and check for error handling and filter out things where this doesn't hold. That's just some Wikipedia details. But this flat map latest brings up another point that I didn't mention. So if you do a web request from your UI and then the user types and you do a second web request, Right? But the first one, for some reason, takes a really long time. It takes two seconds to run. The second one takes, it happens quickly. It only takes 100 milliseconds to run. Right? What's going to happen in the UI? Right? The first one's going to go out. The second one's going to go out. The second one's going to come back. You're going to display the results of the second one. But then the first one comes back. Right? And now you're going to display its result. And now you're completely out of sync. Right? This, is, this is a problem that most people kind of put their head in the sand about because it's hard to solve. Right? Well, because we've got these nice abstractions, the, uh, the, we can now compose these things together. And using fat, flat map latest, it's just going to drop that first one when the second one comes back. It's going to take care of all that bookkeeping for us. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and then finally, we're going to uh, display our response, right? So, um, so here we've got a function that's going to take in the element, and then it's going to return a subscription function that's going to take in the data, and then actually update our UI for us, all right? And then we bind it all together here, where we just have our suggestions observable, and whenever we get a value, we want to display the response from that element. All right, this is all pretty straight, I mean, the code itself, once you understand the, the observable idea, is, is very straightforward, very, very direct. Um, now, there's a bit of a mind shift you have to make when you're learning to program in this style, but once you do, it really, really, really opens up um, your, your systems. Now, your systems are much more in, in sync with how the rest of the world works, right? We're not, we're not creating some false sense of time where we're going to hope that we're going to put locks on things and, and lock down the world while we do our thing and make sure that things are uh, in the right state, right? We're, gonna, we're, we're actually going to say, you know what? Things are changing constantly. That's the only thing we know, that things are always going to change. Let's have a way. Let's, let's accept that and model that in our programs, right? So, um, to me, this is a, a huge step forward for us as an industry. I think it really is going to open up a lot of, um, re remove a lot of errors and open up a lot of possibilities for how we actually interact with our, with our users through our programs. Um, I've got, uh, I'll, I'll post a link on, on Twitter uh, with uh, the implementation of, of this. Um, there's a few other, uh, Demo programs that you can kind of walk through, simple drag and drop. Um, everyone likes this one because it looks cool. Time flies like an arrow. And most of these, um, here, I, I, if, I'm going to show you this paint program too because this is, it's a very simple, use the Canvas API, just draws a line following the mouse around, right? That's That, that can be an intimidating problem to try to solve, right? So, uh, so here's the entire code. Here's the entire program for that, right? <laughs> and, and in fact, most of it doesn't have anything to do with the program at all, 
right? What we, what we care about is when someone is dragging the mouse, right? That's, that's when we draw. When they're dragging, we draw. When they're not dragging, we don't draw, right? Well, here's, but there's, there is no mouse drag event in JavaScript, right? So here we're able to take the mouse drag, I mean the mouse down, the mouse move, and the mouse up, compose those together so that we can get our mouse drag, right? So, so we're going to start off, let me make that a little, a little bigger. Yeah, that works. So we're going to start off and say, all right, whenever the mouse is down, I want the stream from the mouse move. More stuff here. <clears throat> here I'm doing a sliding window of two, because I really want to know the difference between the mouse movements. All right. And then I want, to do, I, I want to take this until the mouse is up, right? That's about the most straightforward implementation I can think of to, to, to do this. I mean, that's, that's the description for it and the code that implements it are, are really, really close. Um, so, and then finally down here, you know, I could, I could take this and I could put it in a library. Anybody can reuse this all they want. And now I just say, all right, when there's a value, right, we're going to get x1 and y1 where it was, x2, y2, where we are, uh, and then draw the line using the Canvas API. That's very, very, very simple, very straightforward. Um, again, this example is in ClojureScript. You can use this today using JavaScript. There's plenty of JavaScript examples out there. You can, it's, it's ready. It's out there. People are using it. Um, there's Microsoft implementation of reactive extensions, so on the server side you can use it in .NET. Uh, the Rx Java that Netflix has released is not as full featured, but it's got the main pieces there and it's going to be growing, I think, pretty quickly over the next few months. So uh, this is technology we can start using today. Um, so if, if anybody would like to know more about this or, talk, you know, come grab me and we can talk about it. So thank you.